welcome everybody to our very first webinar, The Truth About the Chick Charney. Let's start out with a little bit of background about Birds Caribbean. I think probably most of you are fairly familiar with us. We are a regional nonprofit organization dedicated to the conservation of Caribbean birds and their habitats. And uh, together with our partners, our mission is to raise awareness, promote sound science, and empower our local partners to build a region where people appreciate, conserve, and benefit from thriving bird populations and ecosystems. And I'm delighted to see so many of our partners and members on this webinar. Um, thanks for all the great work that you guys do to help conserve birds. All right, so uh, we have our Caribbean Endemic Bird Festival. It officially starts on Earth Day, April 22nd, which is yesterday. And the goal of this festival is to increase awareness and appreciation of the region's unique and amazing birds. We have 171 species that exist nowhere else in the world, which is really, really cool. So in a normal Caribbean Endemic Bird Festival, we have volunteer coordinators, and educators throughout all the islands organizing festival events. We have birding walks, all day festivals, school presentations, tree plantings, cleanups games, photo and art competitions, cleanups, and so much more. Um, and this year's theme is birds and culture, celebrating all of the ways that um, birds are part of our culture his in history and now. So um, this is a picture of some CEBF events in the past where normally everybody's out and about, dressing up, outdoors, birding, having fun, getting together. But as you all know, thanks to this um, global pandemic, we are all in lockdown. Um, we hope everybody is staying well and, doing, and uh, staying healthy. And so we have adapted and we are doing a virtual edition of our Caribbean Endemic Bird Festival and we're calling it From the Nest, which is kind of like from home. So we launched this a couple days ago and every day we are posting on our website and to social media. And we are doing a different endemic bird every day. Um, we have coloring pages and online puzzles. We have activities, eBooks, webinars, and so much more. And as you probably know, we recently published a brand new coloring book called Endemic Birds of the West Indies. Uh, it features 50 endemic birds. Um, I've received copies, hard copies, and we will be distributing them to all the islands. And normally in the CEBF, you would be having stacks of books and you'd be giving them out to all your CEBF participants. So sadly, we're not able to do that this year, but you will get your books and be able to give them out at future events. But for now, we're going to be releasing coloring pages from the book every day as part of our festival. So be sure to, again, go to our website every day to see the new coloring page. And you can download it and print it or else color it in on your um, phone, your uh, computer or tablet with uh, an online coloring app. OK, so I'm really delighted to be introducing um, Scott Johnson. He is our presenter today. And um, Scott is a science officer with the Bahamas National Trust. Uh, he sent me a short bio and now I can't find it. So I'm just gonna have to wing it. Sorry, Scott. <laughs> um, so I think we all know and love Scott. He is a incredible um, field naturalist and scientist. He does all kinds of exciting research, monitoring, training and education work with the Palmas National Trust. And um, I like to think of him as the Scott Irwin of the Bahamas or the Caribbean. I mean, the Steve Irwin, you know, the famous um, <laughs> naturalist from Australia. And uh, so I think he's gonna do a fantastic job today telling us the truth about the Chick Charney. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the controls over to Scott and he will take it away. Okay, hey, um, thank you, Lisa, for that introduction and good day, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, I know that everybody is kind of tired of being on lockdown with this COVID-19 situation, but it is what it is. Um, so today, 
I will be talking about one of the most interesting mythological creatures um, in Caribbean folklore. And that is, wait a second. I don't want to do this. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. And um, like I was saying, we're going to be talking about this very interesting mythological creature, um, one of my favorites in Caribbean folklore, and it is the Chick Trining. But before I jump into that presentation, um, let's talk a little bit about this amazing region we call the Caribbean. So the Caribbean is an archipelago of thousands of islands and keys. Um, and it's divided into three main sections. You have the Bahama slash Lucayan archipelago, which is a limestone, sta uh, stable limestone carbonate platform. Um, it's the most northern part of the Caribbean. Then you have the Greater Antilles, which includes Cuba, Jamaica, Haiti, uh, well, Hispaniola, I should say, uh, Puerto Rico, um, and these are the largest islands in the, the Caribbean. And then to the eastern side of the Caribbean, you have the Lesser Antilles. And they are islands, uh, volcanic islands, situated along the eastern part of the Caribbean plate. So, okay. So, okay, let's try this again. Okay. So you have a unique mix of, ge a geological mix of islands and a wide variety of um, species that are found here. As Lisa mentioned, there's over, there's like 101, there's 171 endemic species of birds that can be found here, but there's so much more to this amazing archipelago than that. There are tons and tons of plants and animals that you can find here. And it is considered one of 34 biodiversity hotspots. And just to give you an idea, it's not the size of, uh, of the area, but how, um, how unique it is. Um, even though the, the total land area of the Caribbean is smaller than Madagascar, we have over 60% more species, just to give you an idea. And so just to throw that out there to you. And along with the biodiversity, we also have a rich and vibrant uh, culture. Okay. All right, so just to help everybody get a better understanding of the islands of the Bahamas, this slide just shows the different types of islands that we have in the Bahamas and the Bahama Archipelago. Um, and so the Northern Islands would be Grand Bahama and Abaco. And the Central Island here would be New Providence. Okay. Sorry, guys. Okay. Central Islands would be New Providence, Eleuthera, Cat Island, Nick Zumas, Andrus. And then you have the Southern Islands, um, which is located right down here. All right. So. What is a folktale and what is folklore? A folklore is an oral story. It's an oral story or a narrative. And the Caribbean, as everybody should know already, is filled with folktales. Folktales are divided into um, several genres. You have animal tales, you have ordinary folktales, uh, jokes and anecdotes, formula tales and unclassified tales. And so what folk tales are, uh, folk tales are usually formul formulaic, which means that they have like a, an introduction such as um, once upon a time. But in the Bahamas, we would say something along the lines of once upon a time was a good old time, monkey chew tobacco and spit white line. And then we would move into our talk on things such as um, the Volcano Barabi and stuff like that. Okay, so the Caribbean is filled with folklore, as I mentioned, and this slide represents just two of them. This lady here, this creature here, she is 
now one of the supernatural creatures in Caribbean folklore. Her name is Mami Water, and is often portrayed as a um, as a being with the head and torso of a woman and the tail of a fish. And she is beautiful, but she's also jealous. Uh, she can be generous and seductive and potentially deadly. Um, she can also bring good fortune to people. And then this picture here is a picture of what's called the Lugaru. I'm hoping that I'm saying this right. Um, and this creature is the equivalent of a vampire. And it lives um, by day as an old woman at the end of villages, or at the edge of villages. And by night, however, she strips into, she strips off her, off her wrinkled skin and um, puts it in mortar. And then she flies in the shape of a fireball through the darkness, looking for a victim. So yeah, um, just a disclaimer on Caribbean folk tales. It is, they can be very dark, okay? All right. Um, okay. Other supernatural folk tales or folk stories include the Garland Wife, which is a woman who can transform into a bird during a full moon. And I'm sure many of you may have heard or been aware of a Nancy the Trickster Spider um, that is, uh, can trace its origins from Western Africa in places like Ghana. And then in the Bahamas, um, we have Burbuki and Barabi, which can trace its origins, not just from West Africa, but also from the Southern US. All right. Birds play a prominent role in folk tales and folklore. Um, on islands such as St. Martin, they call the magnificent frigate bird, the hurricane bird, because it is said that if you see them, um, bad weather, or a hurricane isn't far off. Um, in Jamaica, I mean, sorry, um, the Tainos, the Native American Tainos, they had a belief that the hummingbirds um, were, they formed a bridge between the, uh, the earth and the sky. So amazing um, views from various cultures. And then in Jamaica, they have the gray kingbird, that's this bird right here. And they call this the Pacheri, but they also call it the storm bird, because if they see it just like the magnificent frigate bird, um, uh, bad weather is coming. So we get into, we start to come into the more, uh, uh, more Bahamian centric folktale, and that is the story of the Chick Charney. Um, the Chick Charney legend has existed in the Bahamas for well over 100 years. Um, researchers visiting settlements in Andres in the early 1900s um, heard people call them, um, the, they call them Chico in, in um, an area called Red Bays on Andros. They, um, they are sometimes called Chico. Um, the basic knowledge of the Chick Charney is coming up soon, but before I jump into that, I do have a quick poll that I hope that everybody could participate in. And poll number one is, do you think the Chick Charney exists? And poll number two, very simple, where does the Chick Charney live? One at a time, Scott. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Okay, let's give everybody just 30 seconds or so to answer. You can see the answers coming in. All right, another 10 seconds. I think almost everybody has voted. Good job. All right, so it's showing 30% think that the Chick Charney exists, 25% say no. <laughs> 20% are not sure, and another 25% say no, but I could be convinced. Oh, okay. It's my job to try and convince you then. All right, hold on. Let me just, yeah, let me just get the poll results back over here so everybody can see. 
right. <laughs> kind of jumping around the screen, sorry. Okay, so there's the results. Excellent. All right, so then we have one more poll for you. Hold on, it's coming right up. Question one. Let me see if I can get question two to come up. How do I do that? One second. Here we go. Here is our second question. Where does the chick charney live? Do you think it lives in the deserts? Do you think it lives at Atlantis Resort in Paradise Island? Sorry for the typo there. Or do you think it lives in Pine? Pine forest. Uh, hold on and you'll be able to answer. There you go. Please type in your answers. If you've been to Atlantis Resort in Paradise Island, you know that's a fine place to hang out. <laughs> right, Scott? Right. All right, well, let's see. Um, only 3% of the people say, of our participants say the, say the desert. Uh, 4% think that it lives at Paradise Island at Atlantis and 94% uh, say the pine forest. All right, thanks. Okay, onward. All right. So in Chick Chani folklore and Bahamian folklore, the the idea of the Chick Chani is that one, it lives in Andrews. Um, two, it builds its nests in pine trees, namely two pine trees that that cross or fuse together. It has red eyes. It has the feet of a bird and the face of a man with three fingered hands. It said that it can turn your head completely around. And probably most important, it can bring both good or bad fortune to anyone, uh, to everyone who, depending on how you treat it. Um, I remember two, two short um, stories of the Chick Charney. One involved a man who went out in the, pine, in the Pinelands. And as he's walking along the trail in the Pinelands, he came across a baby Chick Charney that fell out of its nest. And he saw this, it was a weird looking creature. He didn't know what to do, but he saw that it was in, in, in trouble. So he decided to um, assist it and he put it back in the nest and he went home. And the next morning when he woke up, he saw a giant conch pearl, which is a more valuable pearl, more valuable than a oyster pearl um, at his front door. And then in another tale, um, a, a family was walking through the forest and they saw a chick chiney, a pair of chick chinese building their nest. And the child that was there um, scoffed at it and laughed at the chick chinese and threw something at the birds, or the animals. And they did not like that. And so the parents took the child home and told them that you never mistreat a chick chiney. You should never treat a mis mistreat a chick chiney because bad things can happen to you. But the child chose not to listen and decided to go back on his own to that same spot and pesterize the chick chinies again. This time, the chick chinies attacked him and uh, um, injured him severely. Um, he survived, but he now walks around in Andrews with a permanent limp because they injured his leg. And so those are just two simple stories, but they just show that you bad things can happen to you and good things can happen to you depending on how you treat a chick chiney. Okay. So... All right, so 
the real big question that everybody's wanting to, uh, uh, wants to know is, is there truth behind the myth? Is this animal or was this animal a real creature or was it not? And so we're going to get into that right now. So this gentleman here, um, I'm sure everybody may not know who this is, but this is Alexander Wetmore. He is an American ornithologist who um, studied, had a whole lot of interests. He was interested in um, bird migration, bird classification and distribution, um, avian paleontology, which is the study of prehistoric birds um, and bird collecting. In 1937, he received some, uh, a collection of bones that came from a cave deposit in Little Exuma. The bones were sorted by a lady named Vivian Knowles. I'm guessing she was a Bahamian um, from the cave soil that um, was going to be used as fertilizer. Um, when Dr. Wetmore saw the bones, he said, and I quote, I got to read it. The bird bones represent the most important con contribution in new information concerning the avifauna of the Bahamas that has come in many years. In those, in that collection, he found a crow, a flicker, which is a type of, uh, which is a type of woodpecker, uh, and three species of birds, one being a huge owl. So let's jump into um, some information about these amazing creatures called owls. There are over 200 species of owls living on Earth today. Um, they're divided in two families. You got Titanidae, which are the barn owls, and you got Strigidae, which is the typical owls. And in the Caribbean, there are nine native species, of which three are vagrants, which means that they rarely occur in the, the Caribbean. So these are two examples of the two families. This is a borrowing owl in the family Strigidae, Strigidae and this is a barn owl um, in the family Titonidae. So there's some very cool facts about owls that people should know. Um, there are about 189 species, let me go back to this, sorry. There are about 189 species of owls, um, of true owls, and that's the family Strigidae. And they have, they have several characteristics that are different from these guys, the Titos. And that is that they have a more rounder face, they have bigger eyes, um, they have smooth round claws on the third toe, Whereas our barn owls, barn owls tend to have what's called a pectinate claw, which is a claw that has special serrations on it that helps them comb their feathers. Um, as well as some other very cool features. So owls have been around for a long time. They've been around for about 50 million years. And over the course of that time, they developed several features that made them absolutely amazing predators. One such is that owls have binocular vision, which is, um, which is very useful for hunting prey because you can judge the distances from, your, from, um, from you from your prey a lot better than birds that have their, their eyes on the sides of their heads. And so it gives them better depth perception and they can also judge distances better, like I mentioned. Um, but unlike humans, owls don't really have eyeballs. Sorry. Um, what they have is a tube like, uh, their eyes are tube shaped and immovable um, in their socket. So if an owl has to look at you, um, it has to move its head from left to right, et cetera. And the beak of barn owls are low on the face and allows them to see images without its beak obstructing its view. Um, and some species of owls um, have an asymmetric skull. Their air, the air, um, air opening, on one side of the head is higher than the other. And that helps them to develop a, basically a sound map of, um, of their area and what creatures are moving around in the area, especially rodents, okay? They also have strong, stout foot bones, which is useful for grabbing their prey. Um, long legs with wings and, special, uh, and wings with specialized feathers. So this is just an example of the asymmetric skull of a barn owl. There's an air hole right here. There's gonna be another air hole on the other side. And uh, 
looking at, looking at the wings of the bird, you will notice that they have these very interesting comb-like structures on the leading edge of the wing. And that's a very special structure um, that helps them to, helps break up the turbulence that makes the swooshing sound that birds tend to make. If you ever listen to a dove when it's flying, it has a whoop, 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 whoop sound. And that's because of turbulence as it goes, as the um, wind hits the, hits the, hits the wings. Um, the trailing edge of the feathers, which are these also, also have um, uh, fringes on them that helps to dampen the sound. And they also have um, a velvety texture over their wings, which is unique to owls and that helps them to fly more quiet and more stealthier. So what do we know about the Chickchani Owl? Well, it was also known as the Bahamian Giant Barn Owl. So yes, this was a real animal that lived in the Bahamas. It was the largest species of Taito or Barn Owl um, in the New World and it was a meter tall. So it was about the size of a small child. So just try and imagine a bird of that size um, living in the Bahamas. It was found in the Bahamas and it was found on Cuba. And it lived during a period called the Quaternary Period, which includes the Pleistocene and the Holocene. This is from 2.6 million years ago to present. And so this is just some example. This is the Bahamas again, and these are the places in the Bahamas where the Chickcharney was found. It was found on the Exumas, found in New Providence, found on Andros, found on Eleuthero, and recently there was some material that shows that it was found on Long Island. So this bird was distributed throughout the islands of the Great Bahama Bank. It wasn't just found on Andros. And so this slide represents um, what was happening with the, the environment that the Chickchani lived, the Bahamas uh, that the Chickchani lived during the Pleistocene. Sea levels had dropped over 120 meters during the time of the Chickchani owl, and that's almost 400 feet. And that exposed the banks of the Bahamas. And uh, you can see here, this is the Great Bahama Bank. This was once a huge island called Paleo Providence. And it was one of the largest islands in the Caribbean during the Pleistocene. And this was the place where the Chickchani owl and many other species lived. It is believed that the Chickchani owl came from um, Cuba and it flew over to the, to the Bahamas and set up shop here. And it became an apex predator in the, um, in the Bahamas. Um, the Chickchani owl also lived with a bunch of other animals that are no longer found in the Bahamas. And they include the Cuban crocodile, which had a much wider range than it did um, back in the, in the past. I mean, that, now that it did, it has a larger range than it did in the, um, than it does now. The Hispaniola crossbill, the Bahamian tortoises, a special bird called the Bahama eagle, which is a bird the size of an eagle that once lived in the Bahamas, and Creighton's caracara, which is a type of raptor that predominantly scavenged. So we had a wider diversity of animals um, living in the Bahamas during the Pleistocene. So what were these animals eating? Mice were not in the Bahamas during the Pleistocene. They came to the Bahamas during the, um, during the time when, when humans came and Europeans came. So what were they eating? Well, they ate these guys. These are hutias. Hutias are a type of rodent, so looks very similar to a rat. And they were eating these guys a lot. When they found the bones of the Chickchani owl, they found them with tons of bones of hutias. So there was definitely a predator-prey relationship going on uh, with the Chickchani owl and uh, Bahamian hutias. And this was just um, a video just showing when it was playing. 
Okay, so guess I can't play it, but okay, that's fine. Um, so as with everything, to everything there is a season and climate changed. About 11,000 years ago, the climate um, started to change. The Bahamas, then the environment became warmer and wetter and sea levels rose. With that, the Bahamas saw a major loss of animal species because during the time of the Pleistocene, it was cooler and drier than it was today. But now it got warmer and wetter. So species adapted to a cooler and drier environment um, were not fit for this new warmer environment that, uh, um, that was coming upon them. So many of them um, died in the Bahamas or became extinct in the Bahamas. Some of those animals, however, did stick around until humans arrived. And when humans came, that's when we saw um, more of that extinction happening. And the Bahamas, at the end of all of that, the Bahamas lost between 50 and 60% of its bird fauna. And these were some of the animals that the, uh, some of the birds that lived in the Bahamas during the time of the Chick Chiny Owl. You had the red-shouldered hawk, which sometimes can be found in the Bahamas, um, that is a, can be a vagrant. Um, you had the Cuban green woodpecker and the Cuban crow, which now is only gonna be found on the islands of Turks and Caicos. So I just went to show you that and just give you an idea of the environment that the birds were living in, uh, the Chick Chani was living in, um, as well as some information as to the types of species that Chick Chinese lived in. So here's some question. Here's some things that um, people know about the Chick Chinese. They said Chick Chinese have red eyes, but there's definitely a reason for these red eyes. If you look at this, this is a barn owl and this is a boring owl. Both of them have the red eyes. Um, so the retina of owls is very large compared to that of other birds. And they have thousands of light sensitive rods in their eyes. The phenomenal, phenomenal light gathering properties of owls are further enhanced by the large reflective mirror like layer um, behind the retina. So when light hits the, that, um, that reflective layer, um, it gives the, the illusion that the bird's eyes are glowing. And this is what I think um, Bahamians back in the day saw when they saw a chick chining owl. Um, the other thing about chick chinese was that they build their nest in pine trees. So in 2015, um, I was taking some students out uh, in Andrus, and we came across a chick chiny nest. This was absolutely impressive, but I was a little skeptical about it. I wanted to make sure. So I told the kids to stay in the car, uh, stay in the bus. And I went to this nest and I looked up and then I looked down and lo and behold, I found bones. I found, um, pellets when owls eat their prey. Um, when they're finished getting all the nutrients from them, they will regurgitate these pellets that have fur and bones and stuff like that. So lo and behold, I come across these pellets right underneath this big nest. Now, as far as I know, barring, barn owls do not nest in, uh, do not build nests like this. They are more of a cavity nesting type species. And this is actually the result of a fungus that affected the pine trees of, um, of parts of Andrus. But owls use this area as a roosting site. And so it would not surprise me if back in those days, people who were walking through the pine forest, they came across this large clump of forest uh, of, of pine trees and out pops an owl flying off and boom, you have a part of the story of the Chick Chani building its nest in pine trees. Oh, and then the other part of the Chick Chani legend is that a Chick Chani can turn their head 
completely around or they can turn your head completely around and i think that that's a that's kind of a mix up in the wording i think that what what bahamians were really saying is that they could turn their head completely around so as i mentioned in the earlier slide barn owls their eyes owls their eyes are fixed in their skull so they can't move them left and right the way how we can they have to move their heads left and right up and down um Owls can rotate their head as much as 270 degrees. Owls only have um, one um, articulation in their, in, their, uh, in their cervical vertebrae, which means that there's only one bone situated on top of the backbone, whereas humans, we have two. This allows the owls to be able to pivot um, the vertebrae column similar to how you can pivot your foot. And then you have the muscle, the muscle structure in the owl's neck is arranged in a manner that allows them to move like that as well, to pivot their heads. Um, owls also have a special arrangement in their jugular veins, that's the, name, the veins in the throat, um, that is associated with helping to bypass connector blood vessels to ensure that blood supply um, is not impeded when the neck is rotated. So this is just another example of a barn owl. These are barn owls. I did not Photoshop this. This is a barn owl and this is what it can do. It can swivel its head backwards and upside down like that. And so this is also what I believe may have been part of the, that led to the Chick Chiny legend. And so could the Chick Chiny, could the Chick Chiny owl, could this bird really exist or still exist? And the answer is um, Andres is a very large island. I know a lot of my, my colleagues would um, don't agree with me, but Andres is a very large island and uh, it's not very well explored. And so could there be a, a very local population of Chichani owls? somewhere in South Andrus in the pine forest. The pine forest of Andrus, of South Andrus was never logged. So you have an old growth pine forest, a primeval pine forest. So could these birds possibly be living in Andrus? Um, the jury is still out, but I, being the optimistic person that I am, um, I do believe that they could still be alive. Okay, so. so we have our third and final poll. Hold on one second, let me pull that up. Tell us your thoughts. If check charneys exist, should they be protected? Right, almost everybody's voted. Most of the people are voting for yes, absolutely. Figures with this audience. Uh, nobody said no, they're dangerous. We shouldn't protect them. And a few people are not sure. <laughs> All right, here's the final results. 94% say yes, absolutely. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. So on behalf of the Bahamas National Trust and Birds Caribbean, I just want to say thank you all for participating in this uh, presentation on the Czech training. I hope it was insightful. I hope you did learn a few things. And I also encourage everybody, if you haven't, to please join uh, join a conservation group like Birds Caribbean or the Bahamas National Trust. Help us to continue to do the work that we do, which is help to conserve uh, resources as well as um, birds and other animals. If it's not, if we, we cannot do it ourselves, we need your help. And we're doing it um, for, not just for the wildlife, but also for us, because a lot of our, um, our resources, a lot of money that comes into our, our economy come from the protection of wildlife and the animals and plants that are found in the region. 
So I just want to say thank you. And please support us every way if you possibly can. Also, if you are interested in learning more about um, folk tales, Bahamian folk tales or West Indian folk tales, there are several books that you can find on Amazon that are great starters for you. I must admit, um, Caribbean folk tales, like I mentioned, can be very dark. So you may not want children or may not want to read these to children, even though back in the day, children, uh, uh, parents and adults did talk, did teach these stories to kids. One of the reasons being they wanted the kids to behave, they wanted the kids to be obedient, et cetera, et cetera. So they would scare them, scare the living daylights out of them sometimes. And so, um, yeah, these are just some of the books that I, I would recommend, especially an evening in Guanima, if you are interested in learning more about Bahamian folklore. So with that, I just want to say thank you all very much. Um, and if you have any questions. OK. Excellent. Let's advance to the next slide, Scott. Okay. There we go. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much, Scott. That was a lot of fun. And I know that I learned a lot about the Chicharney. So we do, in fact, have a few questions. So hang tight if you can, and let's get a few questions answered. Uh, a couple of people have asked, um, how did the Chicharney get its name, Scott? Where did that name come from? So that is a very good question. I am not 100% sure how the Chick Chiney got its name. I do um, remember it while researching the Chick Chiney that um, earlier accounts of the Chick Chiney came from Red Base and they called it Chico. Um, and I guess over time that evolved into the Chick Chiney um, word, but I am not 100% sure where the name, or, um, where the name uh, evolved or how the name evolved over time. Okay, thanks. Yeah, maybe we can do a little more research on it and, and find out more about the history of the name. Uh, all right, Jessica Oswald asks, considering the first indigenous people to the Bahamas didn't arrive until 1000 years ago, is the myth based on Tito pollens, Tito pollens or barn owls, or maybe from stories heard in Cuba? Like, how did the myth start? Scott, I mean, you, you say that there's people in the Bahamas today that say they've seen the Chick Charney, right? Yes. And so okay. there have been reports from people who have said that they've seen this very large creature in the pine forest and in the forests, um, a large white ghost-like creature. That's what they've been claiming. Um, but there hasn't been any like photographic evidence of it. Um, yeah, the Chick Chiney Owl, um, the oldest bones that we have, the, the oldest remains we have of Chick Chinese uh, date back to the, uh, to the Pleistocene, uh, the late Pleistocene. So that's about uh, 50,000 years ago. However, um, the prey items that these birds were eating, um, they were widely distributed throughout the Bahamas and they didn't go extinct throughout most of the Bahamas uh, through the, throughout most of the Bahamas until uh, when humans arrived. So it is possible that uh, humans and did see and did interact with uh, did interact with Chichanism possibly well into um, modern times. I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Uh, but um, could some of the stories originate from Cuba? I, I, I don't know, maybe. Um, I would like to learn more about Cuban folklore and see if there's any connections with some of the bird lore, some of the bird uh, folk tales that they have and see if there are connections. Um, but I really don't know. Okay, excellent. Uh, so Natasha Silva asks, when did the Chicharney go extinct and how do you explain the persistence of the folk tale? Can you comment a little bit more on that? Yep. Um, again, so the Chick Chani, the, the, the only evidence that we have, the only bones that we have um, of the Chick Chani date back to the late Pleistocene. Um, I haven't heard or, or there hasn't been any other research that I've seen that show um, any more recent bones, uh, or any other remains of the Chick Chani owl. However, you're, the, I do believe that the Chick Chani legend is also tied to the common barn owl. 
um, because its behavior is very similar to that of um, how scientists believe the chick shining owl will behave. And that is that it ate rodents. If you shine light in its eyes, its eyes does turn red. It has a very eerie uh, screech to it. And so just imagine back in the early 1900s, if you're living on um, a family island like Andros and you come across, uh, you walking with a torch or something like that, and you came across this bird on the ground um, with these red eyes and it goes flying off and it starts screeching. That's the perfect set of ingredients that can lead to the um, development of a legend. Oh, I saw this big bird. It was, I was walking my mind in my own business and this bird starts screeching, this creature starts screeching and, and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden now you have, um, that story goes off into, um, it becomes a legend. And so it could be that the chick Chinese owl is tied to the barn owl and even the boring owl. Because even if you look at a boring owl, they do look like little humans with bird-like feet. If you ever looked at them um, face to face, they do sort of look like a human with a bird with a human-like face and bird-like feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, that makes perfect sense. Um, being out in the dark at night, I'm sure I could easily see um, getting spooked. Yeah, and on Andrus, um, a lot of people go crabbing at night. Mm -hmm. So it would not surprise me if they accidentally flushed a, a barn owl mm -hmm. and the barn owl goes off screeching and they go into a panic and go running off right. um, back in the day, so. Right, okay. So Brandon Taylor is wondering, the birds you found on the school field trip, were they recently deceased or more like fossil discoveries? So the bones that I found were, um, those were just uh, rodent bones and some bird bones. And they uh, look like they've been there just for maybe a few, a few weeks, um, or maybe no longer than a month. Right. Um, but um, so that's the most recent that I've seen them. And I did ca carry the bones to the kids and I did tell them that the chick Johnny was real. I mean, I'm, I guess I was wrong for it, but it's good to keep a folk tale going, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, those bones were very recent um, or relatively recent that we found okay, when I cool. went to find those. Very cool. It's always good to be keep your eyes on the ground as well as in the air to see what cool things you can find when you're out, out and about. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Naki Mango Manko, our friend from the TCI, he's wondering, are there any complete skeletons or any other remains other than fossil, subfossil bones? Of the Chick Charney? Yes. I haven't heard of any, um, any other remains of the Chick Charneys other than the fossil bones. I wish that I could find um, some researchers. In fact, I was trying to get in contact with some researchers who studied the chick the owl and, and see if I could get more information about um, what other remains were found. Um, I haven't, they haven't gotten back to me as yet, but um, I don't know if there's any, at least not yet. The most recent bones that were found was in Long Island. Um, and that was just like one, one, one bone. And I don't even, I don't know how old that bone is actually. Wow. Yeah, it would be so cool to find a, find a complete skeleton to be able to put that together and show it in a museum in the Bahamas. Most definitely. Most yeah. definitely. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bruce Marcutt says, I'm a research wildlife biologist and I spent time exploring Caribbean pine forests on North Andros with only a brief glimpse of South Andros. I agree that it is not inconceivable that an undescribed or undiscovered species of owl could occur in the dense interior of South Andros, but wasn't most of the island logged by an, an American company decades ago? Can that you is true. In North Andros, the island was logged. However, the logging company did not make it to South Andros. And so you still have old growth pine forest down um, in the south. And um, it, it, again, it is, it is possible um, that you could have a very localized population um, of birds um, somewhere um, in South, in South, in South Andrews. Okay, cool. Everybody's got to keep your eyes out. Mm -hmm. um, and Giselle Dean, your colleague at the Bahamas National Trust, she asked, how recently was a Chicharney seen in the Bahamas and on which island was it sighted? 
So the most recent that I remember, Chick Chani owls being seen um, based on research evidence was in the, the, late, the late 70s. And again, that was just somebody saying, hey, I see this large ghost-like creature living, this, this large bird, this white ghost-like bird that was um, in the forests. Um, and I, since then, I haven't heard anything else of it besides like people just saying, um, bantering about how the Chick Chani will get you if you mistreat it, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. cool. All right, Valentino asks a good question. He says, in your earlier description about the Chick Chani, you didn't mention the tail. However, I have seen drawn pictures, some with the tail and others without. Um, can you please elaborate on this? So those may just be artistic renditions of it. Um, there were some, um, some uh, drawings that show it, that it does have a tail, others that it didn't. Um, and in some of the stories that I've read, I I've, I've don't recall seeing or hearing that it had a tail. Um, but um, I don't know. It's, it's quite possible that uh, there was just people who was trying to make the Chick Chani more factual by saying, uh, if it's a bird, they don't really have prehensile tails. So let's try and make it somewhat realistic. Um, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So this could be the artist's imagination gone wild. Yeah. Uh, artistic freedom, artistic I guess. License, yes. Yeah, artistic okay. license. Yeah. Cool. All right. And, uh, Jessica Oswald is commenting, hello, I am a paleontologist and ornithologist that worked at the Long Island site. And she says there are only disarticulated fossil bones of um, titopollins. Okay, but yeah, so um, I think, uh, yeah, but it's still, it's, it's still good information to know that they was just found again, only on the Great Bahama, the Great Bahama Bank of the islands of the Great Bahama Bank. Mm -hmm. um, we we don't know 100 percent where all of the if they're going to be found on other islands and stuff like that but it's good and nice to hear from you dr oswald mm -hmm. um i hope that all is well with you too and i really i really enjoy your work as well as your the work of dr stedman and nancy alder yeah absolutely uh, okay, and uh, David Johnson says I am an owl biologist and I'm wondering if it is the American barn owl or uh, the uh, ashy-faced owl from Cuba. The the on on Andros. Oh, it's the American barn owl. It's titled yeah. Fricata. Okay, that's you can find on on Andros and throughout the Bahamas, not the ashy face. Glockops will be found here. Okay, and David's also asking, are there any burrowing owls on Andros? Yes. We've seen, I've seen Andrews uh, as far north as the Georgia Keys, I've seen boring owls up there. And as far south as South, south Andrews in the Kansas Bay area. Okay, and Natalie Roll asks, does the Chick Charney come out at night or in the morning? So it is believed that the Chick Charney owl is nocturnal. And so it would definitely be coming out at night, however, um, if you look at barring out barn owls, even though barn owls usually hunt at night, um, there may be circumstances in which you may see them during the day. Maybe they're looking for resources that may be waning in the area that they are, so they may come out during the day. So it would not surprise me if the Chick Chani would pop out um, at night uh, during the day from time to time, if um, it was still around, which I still think that in some ways it is. Okay, cool. All right, our friend Emma Lewis from Jamaica asks, is the Chick Charney a good guy or a bad guy? What do you think, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I think that the Chick Charney is uh, a creature that you should respect. Um, I think that it's, you shouldn't label it as good or bad, yeah. um, but you should just treat it as a, as a creature that you should respect. Um, if you, if in the event that you do see it. Absolutely. Excellent. All right. And our friend Lester Dudnath from Trinidad. Hello, Lester. He asks, is the Chick Charney known as the young, per known to the young persons today or only the older generations? 
And is the picture of it used locally in local books, newspapers, souvenirs, et cetera? So do so, young people in the Bahamas know about the Chick Charney or is it just more the, the older folks? Uh, well, definitely the older folks would banter about the Chick Charney. I think the younger people, um, they do or have heard, heard about it. They may not have heard as much about it as back in the day. And I know that can also be um, the knowledge of the Chick Charney amongst kids could be um, local, could be on Andrus where more people may have heard of the Chick Charney as opposed to someplace like Cat Island, Long Island. Um, and all those old traditional stories, um, they are starting to, they are decreasing. People aren't telling them as much as, as they once were. And so you, we could be, you most likely are seeing less and less people knowing about that aspect of Bahamian history, which is unfortunate, mm -hmm. um, and Bahamian culture, I should say, right. um, which is unfortunate. But yeah, Chick Chiney, there's still um, hotels in Andrus that, that are called like Chick Chiney Hotel. Mm -hmm. um, there yeah. are still uh, signs and stuff like that that use uh, Chick Chiney logos and stuff like that. So it's still present, but I wish that it was a lot more than what it is now. Right. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, these legends and folklores are a lot of fun. And that's um, part of the reason why we're celebrating birds and culture in this Caribbean endemic bird fe festival, because um, these old folk tales and myths and legends are a lot of fun to talk about. And you can relate them to um, human history and conservation and so forth. So um, we're going to be telling more stories and so forth during our Caribbean endemic bird festival the whole month. We'll be featuring stories about um, birds and culture. Right. All right, our friend Quincy Augustine will take questions for just a few more minutes. Um, from Dominica, he writes, is there similar stories about the Chick Charney in neighboring Caribbean countries? And he says, we have stories of the barn owl in Grenada. So have you heard of Chick Charney-like stories from other countries besides the Bahamas? I think that there were some stories that deal with, well, maybe not Chick Charney, but dealt with barn owls throughout the Caribbean. I'm not um, I'm not very strong on Caribbean, on full Caribbean folk tales. I think that they did talk about the Jumbie bird in, I think, Trinidad. And um, there may be some other places that uh, the barn owl is featured heavily. All right. Yep. It would be fun to hear from you guys. Uh, maybe you can write to us or write anything that you know about stories in other countries in the chat box and we can share the information. Um, yeah, Laura's from saying Jumbie Bird in Trin Trinidad. Oh, okay. Quincy in Grenada. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, Lindy says, could it also be that we got further from the original Ir Irish settlers merged with the West African folklores? What do you think about that? Very, very true. I mean, we assimilate a lot of, we mix in, uh, we put some Caribbean flavor in a lot of um, uh, folk tales from from other countries and stuff like that. Again, look at Burbuki and Barabi. Burbuki and Barabi um, can trace their origins again from Africa and Southern US. We just put a little Bahamian spin on it, but it's still, Burabi is still Bear Rabbit. Um, and there's been stories like the Burabi and the Ta Baby and stuff like that, which um, are strongly tied to the uh, Southern US um, that we still hear um, in Bahamian folktales. So yeah, it wouldn't, it would not surprise me at all. All right, great. Um, and we have a Justin Proctor and he says uh, he, that he's a long time listener, but first time caller. And his question is that he's worried about these Chick Charneys spreading into Southern Florida and messing with the Florida Everglades ecosystem. So he's asking you, what can we do over here to protect ourselves? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I don't think that, I think it would be an honor if we had Chick Chinese all the way um, migrating to Florida. If anything, take pictures and, and let us know. <laughs> so we can really substantiate that this animal still is, uh, this creature still is alive. And I think it'll be more, it'll do more good than harm. Yeah. All right. <laughs> no and Jennifer says, don't worry, the pythons will soon take care of any new arrivals. Oh, oh, that is not good. <laughs> not a good answer. We wish the pythons was a legend or a myth and not reality. Right. All right. So, have I missed any other questions? Um, I'm going to unmute Jessica and Ali, our co-helpers. 
Guys, any have I missed any questions? I don't think so, but Mighty, I wanted to add that there is a devil bird folklore in Cuba. Ah, okay. okay. Can, you us, can you tell us anything more about that? Yeah, it seems to be the, well, hi everyone. <laughs> it seems to be the combination of um, sightings of Stygian owl, barn owl, and uh, short-eared owl. Um, either of them uh, unexpectedly seen in, in the middle of the night in the woods mm -hmm. and screeching. Ah, also, and um, Cuban screech owl, the sound of the Cuban screech owl. Yeah. Um, Very cool. And definitely, even when these are, aren't big birds, the um, creature becomes bigger and bigger while the uh, tail uh, uh, jumps from one person to another. And they end up being like really big birds. But what we do believe is that they're just sightings of these um, owls in, in the woods. Right. Yeah, and very active imaginations, <laughs> which is understandable. Um, all right, let's maybe take one last question that I think I missed before. Um, Jewel Benaby asks, um, hi, Scott, has there been any reported or documented sightings from hunters specifically? I haven't heard anything from hunters about seeing Chick Chinese or large uh, Chick Chinese-like owls um, in Andres. I think that that would have been something that uh, hunters would definitely have, have made made known that they they saw this weird creature somewhere in South Andrews and stuff like that. Yeah. But I haven't heard anything um, anything about that yet. All right. Well, cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much to Scott for this really fascinating presentation. We hope you enjoyed it. And we will be having another webinar next week on Wednesday at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern um, time. And this one will be on Caribbean hum hummingbirds and how to sketch them. We have Christine Elder, who is the illustrator of our um, coloring book, our West Indies Endemics coloring book. So she's going to give a fun um, webinar all about Caribbean hummingbirds, and then you'll learn how to draw one as well. So we'll be sending out an invitation for that by this weekend. And um, we have some other things in the works as well for the rest of the Caribbean Endemic Bird Festival. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we look forward to staying in touch with all of you. And it's been great to see so many of our friends um, signing on from all over the Caribbean, the US, and beyond. So stay safe, take care, everybody, and um, let's stay in touch. Bye for now. Bye, everybody.